Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the Solvable Mysteries podcast. My name is Juras. As every week, I'm joined by Glenn Haikov, who's joining me all the way from California, as per usual. Um, dude, how are you feeling this Friday? Dude, we are melting. This is like the the sun. I just planted <laughs> planted a bit. Like like it got it got cool here for like two weeks. Uh, strangely for August, and then it's right back to the to the heat. And then on top of that, our, our hot water heater broke again so uh yeah that's a good thing it's not cold outside yeah. but but uh you know despite those trials and tribulations uh i have been doing my research on our case this week and um yeah it's interesting you know my, my my kid was kind of uh watching over my shoulder too when i had it on she thought, she thought it was pretty interesting so uh, it looks like this this case definitely has a, a pretty strong following yeah, definitely. And I mean, the following kind of rose for the disappearance of Michaela Bali, um, since her mother has really did the excellent job by keeping her daughter's name in the public, um, going on multiple podcasts. And um, seriously, she was doing a terrific job. Now she does, uh, as we kind of discussed pre-recording, she does hold a few secrets that she doesn't really want to tell about. I think we will discuss about those secrets a little bit later on in the show. Um, now, I want to quickly mention one thing about this case. We have a lot of little timestamps and a lot of like CCTV um, uh, CCTV um, footages that I'll try to jump through the recording. I'm just really hoping I can manage the whole, like the, the amount of content that we have here well. So without any further ado, I think we should just really jump into the disappearance of Michaela Bali. It's a crazy case. It sparked my uh, attention immediately once I read the short description of the case and I was like, I really want to look into it a little bit more in depth. Now, um, Michaela Bali was a 16 year old girl from Canada from a little town called Yorkton which was in the state of Saskatchewan and she kind of disappeared on April 12th 2016 under very mysterious circumstances um I think be, without any further ado I think we should jump to the timeline but before we jump to the timeline actually I want to give a little profile because uh, sometimes I do these profiles when um, we re when we have like a missing person, especially because we really need to figure out what's you know what, what potential traits characteristic. Okay, I can't even talk today. Um, what traits does the person has so that we could maybe assess the reasons why the person is missing? Right. So Michaela Bali, she was born on July. 2nd 1999 in Regina Saskatchewan which is a bigger town and she wasn't living in Regina at the time of her disappearance she was living in Yorkton at the time of her disappearance she was around five foot two inches in height she was around 123 pounds and for everyone who's listening to this not from America that's around 56 kilograms which is a normal weight um, now it says here that her measurements may have changed since because we don't know if she's alive or if she's dead there has been no sight of her well some alleged sightings that most of them turned out to be false but we don't really know if she's alive or dead her natural hair color is red but she is known to have changed her hair color in the past and when she disappeared it wasn't red it was actually blonde um a little bit more about her like uh characteristics um physically blue eyes uh blonde shoulder length hair at the time of her disappearance she had s acne well, some sources stated she had severe acne. When when I looked at her pictures, I wouldn't say that was severe acne, um, but like she did have acne, and she was taking some sort of a acne medication that she left behind when she went missing. So that's one of the reasons why people think that maybe she didn't um, run away in this case. But that's kind of coming up later on in the show. She had several chickenpox scars on her forehead and between her eyebrows. Um, she had a light birthmark the size of a dime on the right side of her jaw, a mole on the right side of her chin, protruding front teeth, 
a scar on her left hand, scars on her upper thighs from self-harm. That's a very important detail. A, she was she had a thin build and a fair complexion. So um, regarding her personal physical characteristics, dude, um, you want to add anything to it? No, I mean, it was, I'll say one interesting thing was that it seems like she's the kind of person where, depending on the light, I guess, and what she's wearing, she could look very different. Like at one point, uh, like I said, my kid was watching some of the background material with me. Uh, for some of the footage that we see later, she actually looks kind of significantly different in some ways than the photos uh, she had. But, um, you know, I'd say uh, she definitely was a, was a, a, a pretty young lady. Let's put it that way. Um, at the time of her disappearance, she was wearing a... Well, she had on thick-trimmed teal eyeglasses, a light green or teal infinity scarf, a maroon or plum coat, a turquoise blouse, turquoise blouse, I mean, black or gray leggings. She also had a maroon or brown ankle boots with chunky heels and a dark blue plaid backpack. That's what we have regarding her physical and personal, you know what I mean, like the stuff that she had on her um, description. Now, she was living with her mother and aunt at the time of her disappearance, mother, aunt, maternal grandmother, and then two younger siblings. Um, so regarding her like family dynamics, you have anything more on that? Because I literally just had this little point that she was living with her mother, her aunt, maternal grandmother, and two younger siblings. So I don't know, the father is not there, right? Yeah, it was... The mother has been really cryptic and really refused to say who Michaela's father was, even even when, as, as we'll mention, someone else claimed at some point to possibly be her father. She just refused to deny, confirm or deny it at all. It's a little bit mysterious to me why somebody would do that, especially if it might at all be helpful, um, I guess, in terms of maybe donating genetic material or, or anything else having to do with it. The one thing I was going to ask you is, uh, do you know, and this will come into play later, what what gender her siblings were? Do you know anything about her siblings? Because I that when I was doing the research that, you know, unlike some of the other cases, it didn't really come up at all. Um, now, regarding her siblings, I just know that she had a little brother because I went on her Facebook page, like the Facebook page for missing... Um, a dedicated Facebook page to helping in locating Michaela. And basically, one of the videos it had, it's like a really hard one to watch where there's like a, a her little brother has like this little bucket hat on to hide his eyes because he is crying. And he's kind of saying that it's her, it's his birthday, but he's not celebrating because Michaela is missing. And then he pleads for her to... Um, contact the police so it's a hard video to watch but from that I gather that at least one of the siblings was a brother but I don't know about the other sibling okay yeah I just find it really curious I mean I have to without moralizing or sermonizing I do find it interesting that you know her mother has like all these kids like but there's no like there's no fathers in the picture. I mean, I wonder if, if the other two kids have a father involved because that seems an interesting way to, to, to I mean, even just, just, it's not even getting into like moral matters, just from a practical standpoint of parenting is hard. So it's hard to do that by yourself, even if you have your mom, let's say helping you. But also from a financial standpoint, that's extremely difficult to do. So I, I imagine Life must be hard for that family and for her mother. Yeah. Well, her mother described Michaela as a shy and quiet girl. One of her high school friends described her as, quote, caring, end quote, and, quote, very conscious about what her friend's needs were, end quote. Um, Michaela enjoyed playing the violin and practiced 
uh, I, I'm sorry, participated in the drama club at her high school. And at one point, really, that I want to immediately add upon, um, the month before she disappeared, I think it was on February, so literally the month before, she did get, like, um, some flowers on Valentine's Day on in, like, the drama uh, class, uh, during the drama class. It was sent in a cardboard box, like a bouquet of roses, I believe. And up to this day, no one knows who it came from. And there was actually slight speculation that she might have sent those herself but i'm not gonna lean towards that since i don't know the details but i immediately want to ask regarding that like a month prior to her disappearance she gets a mysterious cardboard box filled with roses um you have any more intel on that particular event i i, I have more of a question because i'm trying to figure out sometimes schools do this so because like how do you get anything delivered to a, a classroom you know, from outside the school, right? I mean, this isn't like Fast Times or Bridgemont High or whatever, where, where, you know, like Sean Penn's getting pizzas delivered to his class. So I have to wonder, how would you even, how would that even happen like that, unless the school has a mechanism for that? So like when I was in junior high, they used to have like, like candy grams that you could send to people in like homeroom. But I never sent, I never saw that again in school. But maybe, so like, it, yeah. Well, I just step in here well it was the valentine's situation so if the box had clear valentine uh, like stuff on it and indications that it's like just roses you know what i mean maybe yeah, yeah i mean it, it's still pretty weird i mean i have to say here in the states i mean it's even even before like all the stuff that's happened in the schools you know with like like columbine and things like that um i mean unless it was your mom <laughs> your mom bringing your lunch you know, like, oh, Billy forgot his lunch at home. You know, here's here's his lunch. I don't even know how you could go to the office and get them to, to, to bring something to you in class. So to me, that's weird. Maybe it's different in Canada or in her little you know, school district. But, but that part is already yeah. weird. But wasn't? Even, even for Valentine's Day. Yeah, but didn't but didn't they actually found, found out who sent the, the... I think, isn't it the case that they actually... Um, uh, tracked down the person who sent the flowers yeah i think they tracked it down um and i believe it was someone out of town but they kind of no longer suspect him as a suspect um yeah that's what i have do you have any yeah, more on that i think i did do remember hearing something like that there was like a lot of those right as we'll find of these like strange people that are tangentially involved yeah, I think that's that's just my open question. I don't even understand uh, how somebody could send somebody yeah. like a package and while they're while they're in class. You know what I mean? Like that's weird to me. Even even on a on some kind of like pretend holiday, mm. like Valentine's Day. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, okay, so um, she was also attending eleventh grade at the time of her disappearance. And it's very important to know that she had no history of disappearance, disappearing for extended periods or at all, from what I've gathered. So um, this was this wasn't like her routine to go missing. She never went missing before. Um, she may have been bullied for her acne. I don't really have any more information regarding the fact that was she bullied or not. Um, do you have any um, more intel about whether she was bullied or not? I did that. That did come up in several different sources. It was nothing specific, and maybe that's probably because I'm assuming it was other other minors, so other other people under 18 doing it. So maybe they didn't want some kind of backlash against anybody at school. Um, maybe it's like the kind of thing where you know, you have to be careful what you insinuate. Um, I also echo what you said that everything that I had heard about her said that she was she was judged to be extremely responsible and reliable by the both by both the adults and the other teenagers in her life yeah that's that's a good way of putting it now um leading up to her disappearance she had mentioned to her friends several places she would visit soon and we'll get into them a little bit later on um she also claimed to have five thousand canadian dollars in her bank account and although police later confirmed that 
that was not the case. She didn't have that kind of money in her bank account. So I don't know why she said that to her friends. Maybe, you know, really hard to say. Um, one day before she disappeared, she actually sent a text message to a friend asking for a ride to the local TD bank the next morning. Also the day before she disappeared, um, she communicated with the said TD bank several times and she eventually wired $25 to her account. Now, in the evening, she also sent messages to several other friends stating that she was unhappy about something and needed help. And then she disappeared on April 12th, 2016 and has been missing for over five years today. So before we jump into the timeline of the disappearance, basically of April 12th, um, anything you want to add to the, you know, profile? No, uh, other than I think the, you know, people that, that listen to our show and have listened to, gosh, I would say es es especially maybe in the past 20 to 30 episodes, we're starting to see some patterns here. So as, as you go into the details, it's going to be very interesting to even compare this to, gosh, was it uh, uh, two weeks ago when we did, did Susan Sweddle? There's some similarities to that case. And I also saw some parallels um, to Andrew Gosden. So I think that'll be interesting for anybody that enjoyed those two shows that we did to see if you can, see, as, 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 as a listener or, or a viewer of our show, see if you can, you can notice some similarities and some patterns. Yeah, I know exactly what you were talking about, man. Um, so before we jump into the timeline, right, um, I'm going to be showing like a map, but it's going to be a, a little bit of a different map this week. It's going to be a map made on my maps. I think one of the news agencies made this map and it's supposed to have a very like well detailed uh, map of her movement on the day when she disappeared. And yeah, from this map, we can see that this is the town of Yorkton and she did definitely made like... Um, a lot of different appearances in a lot of different places on the first part of um, April 12th, uh, 2016. Her morning began at 6.41 a.m. Michaela sent another text message to the same friend that she asked for a ride to the TD bank. So I think... Um, if you recall, I just mentioned the, the day before, she kind of texted a friend regarding going to the TD bank, and now she texted uh, that friend again. And I will talk about th that friend a little bit later on the show. Um, but that friend actually refused to take Michaela to the TD bank because she told Michaela that the bank will only open at 8 a.m. So immediately, without stopping here for too long, why does Michaela, why is she in such a rush to get to the TD bank at 6.41 a.m.? Isn't it common knowledge that maybe 6.41 a.m., like brick and mortar, like locations for banks, like no one's going to be there at 6.41 a.m., if you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, I can't tell if it's like a, a like a, a product of her age, you know what I mean, that she hasn't used to thinking about that like she's still almost in like little kid mode even though obviously she's not a little kid or if it was just a detail that she lost because it, yeah normally she's on top of a lot of these kinds of things the other thing i was thinking about just now is i wonder if some banks might be open early because you have workers that have to, i know you have like you have like brick and other brick and mortar places that need to do cash pickups before they open you know what i mean so I wonder if she was thinking maybe that was possible that like, you know, the, the Tim Hortons and Starbucks and all these other places, like they need cash in the morning. So it would suck for them to open up at eight or nine and not have stuff ready for customers. And there's, there's some stores that do open, you know, before eight in the morning, I think like, like McDonald's or something. Yeah, no. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, um, but what happened next was Makila's grandmother drove her to school because apparently the grandmother was driving her to school and they 
arrived between 8.10 and 8.20 a.m. Now, the school she was attending was called Sacred Heart High School. So the first point in our little map here is this little point right here, Sacred Heart High School. It had CCTV cameras and at 8.21 a.m. Mikhail was captured on one of the CCTV cameras, putting a binder inside her locker and leaving the school through the back entrance at 8.30 a.m. So she's pretty much flanking a uh, school, right? It seems like uh, ditching. I think is the word you're looking oh, yeah. for. Yeah. So she's yeah, yeah, ditching. ditching yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's like it's, and that was like one of the first alarm bells because that's not how she operates, right? That's that's like the complete opposite of the expected behavior. So that's pretty similar to like Andrew Gosden too, where somebody with like a, a perfect record, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it's like they're able to take perfect advantage of that. Now, the one thing I couldn't help but wonder was, how does that not, I know, so like I, I, I kind of learned the hard way when I was a senior in high school, uh, I ditched school, and um, you know, everything was fine, and then they called my parents, uh, just automatically. Yeah. Like, just, that 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 because like even in the 1990s, the school started like automatically calling your home if you missed school. You know, whether or not it was, it was for a good reason. Mm-hmm. No, it makes sense. It makes sense. It wasn't like that for me. Like I could go ditch and they wouldn't call. So I don't find it sus suspicious. But at the same time, I think it's a good practice to call immediately uh, for like safety concerns. But now I have another question for you, dude. Um, if you remember in the research, I'm sure you heard the little fact that Michaela on the day when she disappeared, she had a backpack on her, but that was not part of her regular um outfit when she went to school she would like go with a purse but for this particular day she had the backpack like she clearly had something like on her that kind of indicated that she was gonna you know potentially not do her regular routine which leads me to thinking did the grandmother find it suspicious that she had the backpack you know yeah it's true it's kind of straight i mean how would she even I'm assuming they must have bought a backpack at a different t point and she didn't want to use it. So does that mean she was like carrying her, her books in her folder under her arm when she was at school? That's a good question. I don't have yeah. that particular detail. Um, there is a CCTV, but I think we only had like stills, but maybe there is actual footage. Now, regarding the binder, it's just a regular binder. The school said that there was nothing of interest there and police checked to make sure that was the case. Now, between 8.40 and 8.50 a.m., so 20, so 10 to 20 minutes after she leaves her school, Michaela attempted to pawn a silver ring at Terry's Pawn and Bargain, which was a local pawn shop. The clerk did not make an offer for the ring since it was of low value, not worthy of an offer. Now, if we're going to jump to the map, bam, this is the next point. So um, she walked a little bit, as we can see, uh, made, you know, walked in the southern direction, then walked a little bit to the east, and she arrived at Terry's Pawn and Bargain. What do you make of the whole situation with her trying to what what it says here pawn a silver ring meaning getting money and then having to return that money with interest later on so as opposed to just selling it what is happening there yeah and that was like another weird random thing where just like the bank she seemed to not really have a i guess i mean in fairness i mean most people probably don't really have a lot of experience with pawn shops or, or places like that. Yeah. She goes in there and the, the, the guy who's running the places like, or working the counter is like, yeah, that's not really worth anything to us. It's not, you know, it's not a, a, a not, not a valuable enough piece of jewelry. And she, she didn't seem to have any real emotion over it. Um, given, some of the other transactions that we're going to talk about later, it's a little bit interesting because I, I can't, it's, it seems like she was trying to accumulate money 
Yet, as we'll find out, there was another potential source of way more money than the little bit she was trying to get. So it seems like she was strategically and covertly trying to accumulate, you know, what she could get without, I guess, arousing attention, if that makes sense. Um, I also, also the other thing that I thought was kind of weird was, um, was it on this path or after this where she was seen like kind of walking along railroad tracks, like uh, on the railroad tracks? It was the initial, yeah. in, initial, initial, uh, when she left, uh, her school initially at 8 30 a.m she kind of walked if you would look here dude she kind of walked uh, in the southern direction and this road is uh, uh, actually like nearby to a um a railroad so i think yeah. it was initially like she walked on the railroad but then yeah she's uh, walking like on the on the rails which yeah. That also seems like almost like a little kidsy thing. Like when I think of the girls I went to high school with at that at that, at that age in eleventh grade, I can't really think of like almost any of them doing that. So that's kind of like a weird younger thing to do. It's a little bit playful, but I also it's extremely dangerous. By the way, I mean unless you know that a rail line is um, like not running, not you know like like, like it's 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 like out of business. Like, please, listeners and viewers, never, n never do that. That's a really bad idea. People get killed like that all the time. Yeah. Um, so, in respect to what she did next, right, after... Okay, before we move, I think we need to address the fact that you just mentioned, because I don't have that point uh, in, like, the details that I'm going to be talking about regarding the other source of money. So, I was kind of thinking, just for us not to forget, Maybe we should address it a little bit like now, if that makes any sense. So from what I've gathered, and I don't really have a lot of information, I think there was like a good chunk of money in, you know, um, Michaela's household. I think the money belonged to her mother and uh, Michaela knew of the location of the money, but she didn't touch that stash of cash. You know what I mean? So you have any more intel regarding that whole situation? Yeah, it was weird because it was some substantial, it was the emergency fund and it was some substantial amount of money. And, you know, if she needed a good chunk of change, why would she have not taken that? Especially if, depending on what we say, it's going to, you know, was, was the goal and the theories at the end, you know, she really wanted it. And that, that once again, that's similar to me. A little bit Jay, like Andrew Gosden, and in more than one way. I mean, uh, uh, is it also worth mentioning that on top of you know not 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 taking that that money, she also had not taken her phone charger. She had not taken her make her her. Um, I don't think I don't think she took her makeup with her, and she didn't bring her medication with her either for her acne. It's very important. It's very important because I think she was taking like the really strong medication for acne that she needs to keep taking, like the one that will maybe um, do some psychological uh, like <laughs> yeah. weird things. I took that one. I probably, it's probably Accutane. I mean, that's what they yes. said. It's funny. Yes. I, ne I never heard about the. I never heard about the psychological stuff until long after. I never. That, but I, it's really powerful, though. It used to like. It really dries you out. Like my, I, I never would get nosebleeds, and and until they gave me like a special medicine to put up my nose, I would get bloody noses for like nothing, mm -hmm. like uh, like like even when I was working on TV sets, as an extra. I remember on like the the set of nine hundred two one zero, getting a nosebleed for nothing, and like a couple of the people on the show like just staring at me, like thinking think, thinking something bad had happened. And it was like, oh no, I didn't fall. I just the stupid medication. But it, yeah, it's it's really powerful. Um, it makes you really sensitive to sun, um, so you you can get sunburn much more easily. And um, actually, if you're a female, you have to take pregnancy tests every month for it because if you get pregnant while you're on it, it causes like massively uh, massive defects to a fetus. Um, and then you're also supposed to take blood tests monthly to make sure it's not destroying your liver. Jesus, that seems like a lot. But but I, I'll say on the positive side, it basically cured my acne. I mean, I, I, I only wish that I had started earlier. Mm, I see. 
well, I never heard about Accutane, for instance, but from what I've gathered recently, a very powerful drug indeed. Um, moving on, what she did after she left um, Terry's pawn, pawn shop, um, between 8.50 and 8.55 a.m., she was seen at the TD Bank, the same bank that she asked her friend for a lift to earlier in the morning, and the friend refused, stating that the bank won't be open, but at 8.50 it was definitely open, so she goes inside of the bank, she withdraws $55 from her account, and then she left at 9 a.m. walking east on Broadway Street. So without stopping here for too long, she trans he she wired 25 bucks the day before, but now she withdraw 55 bucks. So wouldn't it make more sense for her not to wire the 25 and just withdraw the 30 the next day? Like, you know what I mean? Like that's kind of just weird. It has Andrew Gosden written all over it. Now, the one thing I just thought of just now when you said that was because I think if, if it's not clear um, for what you and I are saying to, to the listeners, she only withdrew a fraction of her account. So just like Andrew Gosden, she didn't clean out her whole account. Um, it was it was like some some smaller fraction of the total value. The one thing I was thinking is maybe she was trying to offset some of the – withdrawal like maybe she was worried that maybe if her mom was at all um because she's a minor right so so you don't you don't really own your bank account um necessarily i think your parents have to co-sign I'm trying to remember how that worked because i got a bank account when i was like starting to work when i was 17 uh anyway yeah so like i wonder if she was worried that there'd be some kind of minimum balance alert that would go out and hit her mom, so maybe if she offset it by putting some extra funds in there first, it wouldn't get below a certain amount. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I kind of didn't think that she maybe was thinking that deep into it, but I kind of see your point now. At about 10, uh, 9, 10 a.m., she left the bank, and cameras captured her entering a combined Tim Hortons and Wendy's restaurant. So on the map really quickly, um, if this was Terry's um, pawn shop, right? This is the bank right here. Um, and then she kind of walks from the bank to Tim Hortons. Well, it's, it's some sort of a weird situation where Wendy's and Tim Hortons are in the same building. Now, uh, cameras showed her entering uh, Tim Hortons and Wendy's restaurant where she buys a drink and then she sat down at the Tim Hortons uh, you know uh, next to the table and she can be seen using her phone on Tim Hortons cameras and she was seemingly taking the phone apart and at one point she then puts it back together and we have a CCTV image here of, I think, that particular um, event. So if I'm not mistaken, yeah, this is this is where, dude, you're looking at, this is like 9.10 to 9.20 a.m. Um, Michaela is right in the corner. Uh, this is Michaela for everyone who's watching this on the YouTube channel. We're kind of looking at the CCTV. And now she, uh, what do you make of this whole situation with her? Now, she kind of sits down in this location right here. Now, she will be sitting in at like a different table soon after. But as you can see, like she was just sitting here and she will proceed to take her phone apart and then put it back together. So um, to me, just before I let you answer, I think it may be a situation where there's a lot of things on her mind and she did it as a distraction more than anything, which kind of indicates that she already had some like really bad ideas in her head of what she was going to do. But that just, but that's just my take on it, Tina. You know? I wonder, I just thought of this now, SIM card. I wonder if she's swapping because I was like, I was like, why would someone do that? Why would someone take your phone apart? I mean, you, you could like, uh, when I had a Samsung Note uh, three, 
I used to take my phone apart to um, to swap the battery. Yeah. Um, you know, just because of, so like like that was one thing I was thinking is if she had like a Samsung. Um, it used to be really really easy to change the batteries in them. So if you're worried about losing charge, so that might be why she didn't bring her charger with her um, for the day. But like that doesn't explain the rest of her life, right? Why she didn't do it for that. But then I was thinking because I I haven't really heard any anything where they they found anything about like all of the phone calls she made. I mean, there's some there's some information about some phone calls from people that were able to report back during the search, but I'm just wondering, is it possible that she got a SIM card from somebody and is swapping SIM cards at this point so she can make phone calls um, in a way that might be more untraceable? I think the police, they kind of think that she was making the phone calls on apps, if you know what I mean. Uh, And that's when the telephone companies can't really... um, uh, get okay. your info so i think she was making the naps but dude look 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 i don't think this cctv will end here so she leaves in this particular entrance and then i think she's gonna immediately walk back out you see you see, you see? and she's gonna leave through the back entrance and um yeah i don't really know what to make of that little thing um so okay so that was one uh brief um moment when she was at um you know tim hortons but she's gonna be returning here very shortly let me just get back to the timeline right um so as you as we talked a little bit she enters the tim hortons she spends there she's there for like less than 15 minutes and she leaves the restaurant then she re-enters almost immediately and exits through another exit right now over the next 25 minutes after she exits tim hortons she was spotted by several cameras near the restaurant her movements during this time uh, formed a wide circle checking the area around tim hortons in a counterclockwise direction so if you would jump back to the map right under the time stamps that we hear i mean um uh let's say area markers so if this is tim hortons right then her next uh next point was here moving a little bit to the northern direction you know uh moving on 145 broadway street then we see her going back to 100 broadway street east which is you know she's kind of moving in the counter clockwise direction is if if ever if anyone's still like uh looking at the map here then she kind of takes once again a little bit of a northern like um route on the 18 fixed avenue i think she then walks past the giant tiger which was i don't know what that is maybe like a restaurant or something like that and she kind of you know now spins around in the counterclockwise direction now she's once again behind the tim hortons she spins around a little bit again gets closer to the tim hortons that she kind of left previously and i think she then re-enters tim hortons at 9 49 a.m so she left tim hortons at 9 23 a.m and then 26 minutes later re-enters and for the 26 minutes she kind of did a little spin around the restaurant does this like look to you like she's potentially waiting for someone and maybe she's just trying to kill some time because this like screams to me something that i would do if i was waiting on someone and i knew that they will arrive like in the next 30 minutes I would probably just walk around a little bit so to me that kind of seems like this is what's happening here but maybe you have like a better uh opinion i guess that makes sense i mean i have to wonder if she's under 18 look how free she feels to be walking around during school hours um 
I mean, she must feel like she looks like enough of an adult that no one's going to question her, right? Because, you know, sometimes, like, you could actually get in trouble with the cops if, like, kids are supposed to be in school right now and you're, like, a 16-year-old and you're running around a public place. Like, if a cop sees you, they might say, hey, what, you're like, what's the deal? Aren't you supposed to be in school? Like, why are you not in class? Mm. Um I don't know. I mean, part of me, when, when I saw her go out the front door and then go out the back door or the other door, you know, whatever you want to call it, part of me was like, oh, someone's communicating with her. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be over here. Or I'm going to be over there. I guess I'm starting to get the sense from her actions that someone's jerking her around. That's, that's just my, my, as, as I saw this part of the case, and kind of this this combination of weird communications and our weird activities leading up to this. To me, it sounds like somebody is like communicating things that are not consistent. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I'm going to be here. Oh, wait, you know what I mean? Like they, they keep giving excuses why they're not meeting at exactly the place, the time and the place they're supposed to be. I mean, I don't know if you've ever... Yeah. Had to deal with someone like that, but yeah, it's. I mean, it, it, I would say in this case, especially that it's potentially something illicit for one or both of them. I mean, illicit for her because she's supposed to be in school right now, right? So whatever, whatever it is, she's keeping this activity hidden from someone else. And then, if the person that's doing this, potentially leading her on, like if it's a guy is, you know, <laughs> not her age uh, in doing this, I mean, that person might also have something to hide. So I can't help but wonder what the weird bargaining process is because there's another weird conversation that goes on, right, in this Tim Hortons. Yeah, um, we're, we're about to get to it, dude. Um, so she re-enters at 9.49 a.m. to the Tim Hortons once again. Now, this time she sits down at another table. And let's quickly jump to the CCTV as well. So um, this is the, the footage right here of 9.49 a.m. She, so we're going to shortly see her uh, re-enter once again on the CCTV. Now, I'm just going to read... Uh, what happened during her second stint at the Tim Hortons. As you can see, like, this was her. Like, we could see her entering from the entrance that she left from. Um, over the next 20 minutes, she can be seen using her phone repeatedly, sending text messages and making what appears to be lengthy phone calls. Now, the you know, the telephone provider didn't really see any telephone activities so this is why police heavily suspect that she was using apps such as kick or um you know whatsapp or snapchat or whatever to communicate with people because there wasn't any phone records so as we can see she's on the phone now it's either she's on the apps or she's pretending to be on the call well the way that she kind of just removed the phone from her ear like literally i just want to quickly jump back to this i think it's important dude if you would be look at this look at this um this to me doesn't look natural like this like and i'm just noticing it as i'm going so that's why i'm kind of stopping here doesn't really look natural it either is she's pretending to be on the call or she's calling someone but someone's not picking up which is also like a very likely scenario so um over the next 20 minutes she's been she will be using the phone as we can see she's like she does something very interesting look how she positions herself now she's positioned in a way that she now sees um, the outside of the Tim Hortons restaurant like she's scoping out the area seems like she's definitely on the call now um doesn't look like she's pretending looks like a natural call actually um what happens next is uh she is seen leaving the restaurant oh no no i'm sorry at 10 12 a.m she will send a text message to one of her friends quote hey i need help and then after a couple of minutes, she will follow up with a quote, never mind, I figured it out. And then she is seen leaving the restaurant again, only to re-enter it shortly at 
10 43 a.m so let's pause it right here a little bit dude um what do you make of the whole situation with her um texting her friend i need help but then texting immediately that i figured it out <laughs> her friends in school right I mean, that's everywhere. all of her friends are in school so i don't know how her friend could help her i mean what, hey i need help sounds like an emergency right um the friend the, I, just, I just want to quickly add some yeah. more, uh, uh, details here the friend that i'm referring to um she had left her phone at home for some strange reason that day um and she only saw the text messages in the evening when she returned from school right so the, yeah there was uh, and if if and even if she had got them it would have been you know this is still this is like what second period uh in a, in a high school day so yeah you know it's interesting when you pointed out what looked really unnatural was the way she was sitting like when you look at that how she's backed into the corner there she's the only one in that whole place who's sitting like that I mean, obviously, most of these people, I don't know about what, 70% of these people are, are sitting are, are sitting with other people and having coffee and enjoying themselves. Um, looks kind of nice, actually. Looks like a nice uh, nice little scene in the, in the um, like the Tim Hortons is actually like a little social, like, like gathering place mm -hmm. uh, for that town. But you know what I mean? She's the only one who's like kind of, she's kind of tucked into that corner weird. And then... You know the other thing you said about her putting it up to her, to her ear, sort of erratically. So either like she's checking something. I there's one thing I thought of is, on I know you can do this on Facebook Messenger, and I think you can do it on a Kick and things like that too, which is one of the the social apps she used, where you can leave. You could almost use it like a like a, like a Nextel phone. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Like Nextel phone used to have like push to talk. It's like you can you can leave like a, a voice message. So for whatever reason, the person wasn't in like a synchronous call with her, but they're leaving like little little sound bites back and forth to each other. I know, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of use some sometimes that because it is kind of handy when you don't have the time to like text uh, and you can't call. You know what I mean? But you want to give some information, so it is useful. Yeah. But I don't think she was in a situation where she didn't have the time, right? Um, uh, let's see what happens next now um she's gonna soon leave uh, the tim hortons once again i think she should have this call right now and i think she should leave if i'm not mistaken according to my um the timeline that i have she's supposed to leave and then re-enter one last time but let's see what she actually does so this is you know on her second stint in and she takes a look to her right a little bit. And now this woman right here, she's going to play a role soon. But I just want to know that if she will walk out. And she looks like she's thinking about something. She looks like she's contemplating stuff. Um, okay, let's jump to the second CCTV. Um, I think... She, okay, so my bad. I think she definitely... The, okay, so they they kind of okay, okay, yeah, it makes sense. So they kind of okay. So the timeline that that I have, this is her third stint in the Tim Hortons because she abruptly left once more. For everyone who was watching um, the CCTV, I think you all can re recall that she kind of left for the second time and then re-entered Tim Hortons for the third time. And now she's gonna walk up to this old lady right here. So I quickly want to read out what will happen in this particular interaction and then I will play the clip so um uh you know she re-entered at 10 43 a.m and then Michaela then walks over to an elderly lady and starts a short conversation now police was able to identify this elderly lady who told them that Michaela had asked her for help in renting a hotel but now this old lady politely declined to help out Michaela. All right, and then we could like see what happens here. So she walks up to this old lady that was later identified. Look how weirdly she just sits down there. Like okay, so I think I wouldn't at 16, I would I wouldn't I would be too socially awkward to walk up to a random person and ask for such an 
favor if you know what I mean like wouldn't you feel the same way a little bit yeah it's it's weird I mean I, I do get that because it's two women like you know as guys it's a little weird it's, it's even like extra weirder yeah. you know what I mean because I don't know I don't know if you agree but there's like some some boundaries I guess in the way you might ask like a, a guy you don't know like to not get too close to not assume you could just sit down there across from them and i know for women sometimes things can be more social where it actually would be the opposite where like it could be okay if you were going to make a request you might want to sit down and, and be face to face and and do it this way but the request itself is outrageous especially for a teenager exactly. so and then the the dollar value also of what's being asked is something that's something i would expect out of like if it was a teenager, like a teenage beggar, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm dating myself a little bit, but like there's certain parts of Los Angeles that when they didn't used to be filled with homeless people, um, certain like, like kind of, I guess, kind of touristy and well, well-traveled areas where you'd have like kind of like teenage runaways and just beggars and stuff who would try to like ask for stuff like that, ask but for this, change. But and this, like but that. this but, is not the yeah. situation, dude. Uh, no, no. Yeah. She didn't ask for her to rent out, just rent out from a legal standpoint, like Makila was still going to pay for the. If okay. You, yeah, yeah. She, yeah. It's, it's only she wasn't asking for money, like financially, just for okay. the fact because legally she can't rent out. So yeah, she there can't wasn't. Get... Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I'm glad you straightened me out on that because I would that was not clear to me. That's still it's still, um, you know what I mean? I mean they don't they don't know each other. To ask a complete that's that's like almost one upping like <laughs> hanging outside the seven eleven asking someone to buy you beer. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know. I mean, I mean I know. even that's like a like a lower lower even that's like because you know, in that case, you're still giving them your money to buy it, right? Yeah. But like, yeah, it's a little it's a little odd. After you know, they end their conversation, Makila uses her telephone again and quickly leaves the restaurant i think for the last time this time so she leaves um tim hortons at 10 45 a.m and she is walking west on broadway street east so as we can see now she's gonna walk out i think there's gonna be another clip of her walking so we can see her in the top right here walking in the i would say normal manner normal manner not necessarily rushing just you know walking i guess off in the distance um after a short distance she turns around and she actually heads south on 7th avenue however she quickly turns around again and continues west on broadway street east uh yeah so i just i just want to okay so that they just showed her um finishing the walk right so um once again this is her second um this is the second part of her uh, movements at least on this map so she heads let, let's see she heads a little bit to the west uh to the western direction then after a short distance she turns around and heads to the southern direction but then she once again turns around she i think heads like in the eastward direction i mean westward direction from there on out now there is no camera footage of her at 11 35 a.m but at 11 35 a.m she actually sent another text message to her friend and the text message read quote i'll see you at lunch and at 12 p.m she re-enters her high school so she Essentially, what she did, she um, ditched school at like 8.30 in the morning. And then for the next, let's say, three and a half hours, she was walking around downtown Yorkton in Canada, Saskatchewan. And she entered the pawn, stop, pawn shop. She entered uh, the bank. She entered Tim Hortons. 
Then she left Tim Hortons, made a counterclockwise walk around Tim Hortons, got back into Tim Hortons, made several phone calls on apps, we assume, asked for a lady to help her rent out a hotel room, which she was still gonna pay for it, but, you know, just legally she couldn't do it. Then she left, and then we don't really have any information on what she did for around an hour after leaving Tim Hortons, but around 12 p.m. she re-enters her high school. We have image, we have another footage from her high school, so before I play it, I want to quickly read out what happens there. Michaela in goes straight to the cafeteria and meets with two other students. Um, now, the students confirmed that Michaela told them about plans to take a bus to Regina for a vacation, I think on the same day. And then Michaela leaves the school once again three minutes later. Um, so yeah, let's just quickly check out how this interaction went down. So this is... It's 12 p.m. It's not 2 p.m. For, for a brief moment, it said to you. It's 12 p.m. As you can see, this is the cafeteria in her high school. And now this is Michaela. And as you can see, she will just walk up to some friends. And she will tell them that I'm going to be taking a bus to Regina for vacation. And, you know, Regina is the town, the city that she was born in. Regina is um, around the two hours from Yorkton, and Regina is a place that she wanted to move for good, like, at least that's what her friend said, but that's just because she wanted a, to live, like, you know, on, a, on her own a little bit, and this is actually the last CCTV ever. There, there will be, like, um, eyewitness accounts, but this right here is the last CCTV we have. And quickly, without stopping here for too long, dude, I kind of want to ask you a question. Like, why did she return to, to school? Like, was there a point for her to return to school? To, like, literally walk up to, like, these two friends for, like, two minutes and then tell them that she was going to take a bus? Like, what what's happening here? It's real weird. Even her... Her body language is like a little weird with it, so I don't, I don't, I can, I'm sort of torn between wondering if she's like providing an alibi for where she's going to be in case someone asked. I mean, is she just trying to like impress? Just, just like the bank account, the the pretend bank account number that was much higher than reality. Had, because because she she she'd done all these weird. All this weird talk about her plans before this, you know, in the in the days and weeks leading up, she'd been talking a lot about wanting to take a trip to Regina and and sort of I, I guess in, in retrospect seemed inordinately focused on that topic. I guess I, I mean I don't ever really remember talking about that kind of stuff at all with my friends at that age. Like oh, I want to go this place, I want to go that place. Like that's a lot of daydreamy talk almost that maybe was a warning sign I don't get how she can just walk out of her school like once again you know it wasn't so easy at the schools I went to I mean it's not like uh, the school wasn't that locked down but there were like people monitoring the halls it was, it was harder to go just right out the front door without at least maybe a security guard or somebody seeing you Yeah. so it's a little it's, I guess there's, once again it's just maybe a little bit different culture for small town Canada Versus, you know, um, uh, suburban Los Angeles. Yeah, I think that's the case, actually, dude. Um, now, jumping back to the map, right? Now, as I've said, there is no more CCTV footage of Michaela, but there is eyewitness accounts. And um, she was seen at the local STC bus depot that is now not there anymore. It kind of shut down in 2019. So if you're going to try to find it on your own, um, you're going to have a hard time doing it. But we do have a point... Um, in the map, right, um, we're gonna, it's somewhere around this location right here, and we don't really have necessarily the point in the map here, but she does enter, um, she does enter, oh wait, I, I'm sorry, I think this was, yeah, this is the trail stop, I'm sorry, this is the trail stop, 
So this is exactly the trail stop a location where she is last seen and after this she will vanish forever um and as you can see it's kind of in the same direction where she kind of spent the whole previous first part of the day just strolling around downtown Yorkton so maybe she was in fact trying to meet with someone and she kind of and as you said that that person was kind of jerking them around and now they told her, let's meet up at like 1 p.m. And she was like, okay, so it's 11 a.m. I have another two hours to kill. I'll just go back to high school to make it seem less suspicious, perhaps. I mean, I for sure could see that happening. Now, she enters the bus depot and there's a restaurant. Um, but before that, she enters it and she asks at the depot um an employee at the depot when the bus to regina would leave so she asks physically like yo when is the ne next bus to regina and when she learned that the departure would be at 5 p.m so five hours from that point in time she left the bus depot without purchasing a ticket and her next stop was at the trail stop restaurant attached to the bus depot where she ordered a lunch. Now eyewitnesses say she left the restaurant between 1 and 1.45 p.m. After that, no one remembers seeing her and she does not appear on, on any other surveillance footage. So really quickly, dude, without stopping here for too long, she clearly asked for a bus to Regina like when it's gonna leave to, so to me and she kind of said in in school to the last people that she spoke in the cafeteria she said she's going on a vacation to regina so like to me the screams she was clearly heading to regina you know what i mean at least the intention initially was to do that yeah or at least that's what's coming out of her mouth but then does it happen the <laughs> Because that, from what I saw, that was the confusing part. As she goes and she has presumably money to go to Regina, and then no Regina bus ticket, right? Police were able to verify that she did not get on any of the buses that day to Regina or anywhere else, which means that she must have traveled on by other means so she the, the like they checked who like you know stepped into the buses and the police were able to verify that she did not do it i don't know how exactly but it says that the the, the cops verified now Michaela's phone was turned off at 6 51 a.m the next morning so i have a question here in the timeline what does this mean? Michaela's phone was turned off at 6.51 a.m. the next morning. Like, I, I'm, I, I assume they don't have her phone. So how do they know that the next morning her phone is turned off at 6.51 a.m.? Like, the telephone company can check when the phone was turned off? Yeah, that's true. I wonder if there's a signal that got sent. Uh, I mean, I, I guess that's where people would point, point and say, oh, you know, that's, that's something to research. But, yeah, I mean... I mean, I have to wonder, though, since she didn't bring her charger, could it have just run out of power and turned itself off? Yeah, perhaps. Because her charger's still at home, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, Michaela has not used any of her social media accounts since then, except for a one weird occasion where her friend sent her a Snapchat message, and then that message became marked as open however it could not be determined if anyone actually viewed the message this was a really gray area for me in the timeline with the snapchat message that allegedly got viewed and i think this happened like what like month after she disappeared so it's like do you have any more information regarding the snapchat message that got viewed apparently because from what i've gathered i just want to quickly add that it seems like it's really unlikely that michaela actually saw the message you know 
Yeah, that was this was like one of those things that was in dispute because one of the uh, so then somebody said I guess one source said that well what happens is if Snapchat closes out your account for whatever reason like maybe from lack of use or some other some you know whatever it is X Y Z um, that they'll start actually deleting messages or like archiving messages and that something about that process would send the f a false indication that the message was opened. So that was what one, one, <laughs> one source said, but then, but then the same video I was watching said, well, but on the other hand, another source said that wasn't true at all and that they don't, they don't actually do that. And so then, it was, you know, we ended up in the same place where there doesn't seem to be anything conclusive about why, what that would be. Now, we have run into this before, though, right, with other previous, I mean, even, you know, one of our most popular um, topics uh, on our show, uh, the Chris Kremers, Lizanne Fern thing, where there's a lot of kind of back and forth about what does it mean when the phone does this or, you know, um, there's a lot of uncertainty about telecommunications and sort of associated applications within that about whether whether a human was actually involved or not. Yeah, I do agree that it's a great, great point and we can't really get too much out of it. I would lean towards that she probably didn't see it because it would be weird how she used Snapchat once but never used anything else ever again. Doesn't seem natural. Police also confirmed that her bank account has not been used since then, since she disappeared, and she does not have a passport with her, which would make it difficult for her to leave the country. Although she used her phone extensively throughout the day, no phone calls were registered by her cell, cell phone provider, and she is believed to have used social media apps to communicate on the day of her disappearance. Both police and her family received hundreds of tips to her possible whereabouts over the years, including possible sightings in Vancouver in 2016, Grey Eagle Entertainment Center, it's basically a um, like native casino or something like that, um, in 2017, um, Edmont in Canada, I mean Edmonton, another city, another big city in Canada. Um, she was apparently cited in 2019 and her mom actually says that she's willing to investigate that particular sighting in Edmonton on her own. And then Ben Penticton in 2020, although local police was able to confirm that the person in question was not Michaela. So a lot of sightings, like every year, like a big sighting, like was a yearly occasion, but they all seemed to lead to nothing, it seems here. And I think now that the timeline is done, I think I definitely want to go through the thoughts section. And once again, I have a lot of points here and a lot of points regarding the things that were happening before she disappeared like on April 11th because I really want to touch upon those uh, time points and throw it back to you as well so just regarding the day of her disappearance like the timeline of April 12th do you have anything more to add uh, before I move to April 11th no I don't, I don't think so I think we've 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 given this a lot of detail and I think color commentary but yeah, I, I have, you know, I have, I have some specific thoughts teed up. I don't know that I have any about that specific day though that you haven't, uh, I think already done a great job of, um, you, you have already done a great job fleshing that out, I think. Thanks, man. But I still want to talk a little bit about 11th of April because it's going to give us a better picture. So um, she had a bunch of close friends it seemed like but the closest one that actually were questioned by law enforcement were Oksana Yakivichuk, Shelby Hnatuk and Amy Liang. These names are kind of interesting here. Now the day before Michaela went missing she got into a car with Shelby and 
another friend Oksana to have lunch at the fast food restaurant. Now this is happening on 11 on April 11th and Michaela's friends said that they remember her talking during lunch about going somewhere and they weren't sure. They were they, they think they heard the Moose Jaw Prince Albert um as two of the places that she could have went to. So I have on the map here um this okay okay so this would be regina as we can see this is yorkton and regina the you know town that she told that she was leaving to on the day when she did disappear is like two hours in the southwestern direction now um moose jaw is literally en route like if you pass regina and you drive for another approximate um 50 kilometers then you will reach moose jaw it's also in the western direction well you know the day before she disappeared she kind of mentioned moose jaw to her friends during that lunch break um she also mentioned prince albert now prince albert is a little bit more interesting because prince albert is in the northern direction so it is interesting how mm. she if she did mention both of these areas these are like in completely different um let's say directions from each other so it's kind of interesting and then also um she did mention that she was going to regina for a vacation so she kind of mentioned the regina vacation thing even a day before um she mentioned the, the regina vacation thing to the people in the cafeteria at her school and another interesting point is that she also they think her friends they think she also may have mentioned saskatoon which is also a little bit to the west but like um to the northwest a little bit so um what do you make of all of these locations like like seriously she's she she has been mentioning it seems like many cities you know what i mean it's kind of funny how it's it's all i mean for kind of the teenage daydreamy i want to live here or there they're all they're all strangely semi-practical right like none of them are like i'm going to los angeles i'm going to tahiti i'm going to new york i'm going to you know montreal like it's all stuff that that is like achievable immediately yeah. so yeah i mean I, I don't i don't quite know what to make of that um without trying to shoehorn it into one of the, the theories yeah well her friend shelby hanatuk and i'm just reading how it says uh, hanatuk shelby hanatuk told police she remembered um she remembered michaela talking about a boy named josh but when she tried to ask michaela about him on april 11th she didn't respond another friend amy liang who wasn't at that lunch date on April 11th, said Michaela had told her a man named Christopher was coming to Saskatchewan to meet her. After the last fast food lunch with Oksana and Shelby, Michaela went back to school for Christian ethics class. So this is happening the day before, let's remember. And her teacher later told police that Michaela seemed upset during that class. Now, in the evening on April 11th at 5.30 p.m. and around 6 p.m., Michaela called TD Bank customer service there um, three times. And she checked her account balance and also transferred $25, which, you know, I already kind of posed that little detail that it was kind of interesting to me. Now, between 8 50 p.m. and 9 30 p.m. she sent text messages to her ex-boyfriend to Shelby and then to Amy and now she told Amy that she needed help but didn't respond when Amy asked why she messaged Shelby about a boy feeling bad for someone and um crying so I don't even know what that's all about and then the ex-boyfriend told police that Michaela messaged him that night 
and the boyfriend, ex-boyfriend said she seemed unhappy and was thinking about going to Regina for a couple of days. So once again, we hear Regina for now, I don't know, maybe like the third time in the timeline, we get mentioned Regina. So it seemed like she was hell-bent on getting to Regina for some reason. And um, in terms of that, yeah, that's all I have. Um, so your thoughts section because in the theories i'll have some more information about josh and christopher the two boys in question but other than that um i'm kind of done with everything that i had in my notes so i'm sure you have like some points i don't want to gloss over them so dude have at it please yeah i mean just to, to call it just the, the, the things i noticed um and these are more broad strokes so nothing so specific um but just you know every time i do we do one of these cases um I, especially per this this kind of structure that you've come up with that i think is really really useful for for kind of figuring out how to look at something you know i, I just couldn't help help but notice you know how how similar it was to andrew gosden um, and then some little, some little things that, that were coming up, uh, both about her personality, um, like maybe a positive thing, and then something that was similar to Susan uh, Sweto. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Uh, you know, Andrew Goss and I say there's some real big parallels here. So, you know, really, really good reputation about being reliable, consistent trustworthy responsible like you could almost like set a clock by her just like andrew where andrew you know it's sort of in this he's it's, it's almost got like a rut in his life but like in a good way uh unless you know he wasn't happy with it it's the same thing for her um you know once again being almost penny pinching with the amount of money that's budgeted for whatever the day was supposed to to bring you know like we we always wonder like why wouldn't you just bring all your money? But no no, there's like this certain amount <clears throat> that you're withdrawing. Yeah, I agree. That was a uh, an interesting uh, point. The money, you know, she didn't touch the stash. I mean, it's and once again, I can I can't help because you know, especially if you're not working yet, and you know, if you're not wealthy, which I don't think she was wealthy. Um, and you only have a little bit of money, bit of money in your in your um, your bank account. You can be quite miserly with it, right? Because that's that's everything. So your sort of perspective about what twenty dollars or forty dollars is worth is different. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, when I look at the footage, it does seem like there's a like she's waiting for she's killing time waiting for someone. Like, this wasn't just a hangout day. You know, this, like, like, this body language of looking around. And, you know, I mean, there's there's other things she could be doing with, with her time and was supposed to be doing with her time that day to be playing hooky from school. So I'm not really sure. I, I mean, I, well, before we get into the theories, yeah, I, I mean, to me, this looks like somebody that's communicating with someone that they have plans for because yeah otherwise why aren't you getting on that bus to, to you know Re regina why aren't you getting on your way andrew gosden didn't mess around right i mean he got right on a train and got got the heck out of that town and, and went I, on his mission yeah and for one second i kind of forgot to mention this don't you feel it a little strange how she kept mentioning regina but then she was kind of surprised when she entered the bus station and they told her the next bus is in like five hours if you're so into going to regina wouldn't you like m probably check in advance like the bus times yeah it's it's like it's one thing that's kind of strange especially given one of my next points about her coming up is that she didn't really seem big on some of the research for these key they, i'm glad you brought that up because i didn't even maybe that's what was bothering me um sort of subconsciously she doesn't like the bank, whether it's the bank, you know, details or, you know, uh, just other aspects of her day. She doesn't, you know, you, you think you would know ahead of time, right? Mm. Especially if it's part of some plan. I mean, Andrew Gosden did, not to bring him up, up too much, but I, I know I have already. But yeah, it's, it's, it's strange to me. Okay, um, just moving on. 
Um, I already mentioned I thought it was weird that you're able to just kind of walk in and out of high school like that. Um, because, um, like I said, I don't know if it's different in Canada, but in the United States, having an unexcused absence um, is a big deal, and they take role by class. So, like, if I was in school first period and second period and then gone third and fourth, and I wasn't there the next day with, like, a legitimate reason from the school office that said I was at a medical appointment and my parents, or my parents otherwise said that it was okay. Like that can actually hurt your, your college admissions. So I don't really, it's, it's, it's strange to me that things are, are more informal there, but maybe once again, this is just a culture difference here. Um, okay. Uh, left behind our key, key belongings. Once again, just like Andrew Gosden, um, including, you know, stuff you would need for, let's say, a long-term trip in the future. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there before we get to that theory. So, okay. And, um, you know, people pointed out it did seem like whatever she was doing was not meant to be discovered and that there was going to be an end to the day where she went back home and, um, you know... There, was, there wasn't going to be any money missing from the emergency fund. There maybe wasn't even going to be a noticeable amount of money missing from her account. She was going to go home and charge her phone, go home and use her makeup and her, her acne medication. So there didn't seem to be any long-term trip plan, despite you know the conflicting statement that she makes at, at her high school for you know one of the last moments we, we see her alive. Um, okay. And then last two things, uh, uh, accordion, there's an anecdote about her where it was interesting. Cause it's like, a she's sort of like, a like maybe she's, a uh, maybe she's good at sort of, um, doing things impulsively, like, like planned impulsiveness. Does that make sense? So apparently there was a relative, I think it was an aunt or somebody that she wanted to play happy birthday on the accordion for. So she taught herself how to play the accordion just for that. Like it wasn't like she was really even that interested necessarily mm. in becoming a, an accordion player, but it was some kind of shtick, you know, that she was going to do and she did it like she motivated. So it seems like in that, what I'm, what I'm hinting at is she's not, Afraid, I think. I think if you were to, to look at the Dr. Grande, um, he does that like like ocean um, personality five five factor personality breakdown thing. Um, she's not afraid of novelty. Let's put it that way. You know what I mean? Like some people are afraid of novelty. Some people are afraid of uh, new things um, or challenges. She doesn't seem afraid, and maybe that's why she was comfortable asking somebody to get her a hotel room. Uh, cause she has, she has lower barriers and that's the other, the other thing I'll notice that this is similar to Susan Sweddle is the sudden burst of talking to a lot of different, I, I put quote unquote strangers, uh, presumably other young men, uh, on social media and sort of a, uh, that a high frequency and it becoming, you know, at least according to those conversations, right? We don't know how many of those conversations, the, the people that she said she was she was she was concerned about she's talking about with her friends we don't know how any of those people are actually real because we have indications that at least you know one of the people that she mentioned if she was talking about that person well that was like three years prior to that so there was no no contact going on but if these are other people that she's meeting it's like this burst of activity that makes sense from like a <laughs> Let's say, animal. If you're if you're looking at it from like a, 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 a you know, we as humans are, are animals, reaching sexual maturity, um, and I mean that in just the pure clinical sense. Like we're animals reaching mating age, so you're starting to think about you know developing long term um, relationships, and you know, if, if we were living in cave people days, reproducing. You know, we live in different kind of society now where you're not necessarily trying to become a parent as a teenager but there's still the same hormones 
and you know brain structure driving those those I guess those motivations right so even though now we we've adjusted our lives to sort of match uh, industrialized in the computer age um, but like <laughs> we're still we're still Homo sapiens right we're still um, you know animals being driven by our hormones yeah yeah. Uh, I see. Uh, okay, dude. So, um, given all of that, this, I think it's kind of the time for us to jump into the theories, perhaps. Um, so, okay. So, remember when I said I kind of had some information regarding um, Josh and uh, Christopher? So, I want to immediately just go over those two details. So, um, Michaela's M Michaela messaged with someone from North Carolina named Christopher through Instagram. Now, his name was flagged to police by both Amy and Michaela's ex-boyfriend. Now, um, what we have here is that uh, Michaela uh, told Michaela told Amy that this man Christopher who's from um, who's from uh, North Carolina was gonna come to Saskatchewan to visit um, and then the ex-boyfriend told police that he heard that Christopher was visiting the province to see his mother in Saskatoon now CBS contacted a man who said he was the Christopher who Michaela had been talking to online and he declined to answer any questions about his communications with Michaela but sent a brief emailed response to CBS to CBS's request for an interview quote all I can provide for you is that she suffered with self-harm a few years back. End quote. He said, so basically that's what he said. And law enforcement said there is no evidence that this Christopher was even in Canada when Bolly disappeared, uh, when, you know, Michaela Bolly disappeared. Now, police did not have the a last name for the other kid named Josh, so he was a bit of a mystery to everyone, um, but law enforcement did interview multiple people with that name as they came across them in their investigation. One of those people was from the town of Churchbridge, about 60 kilometers southeast of Yorkton. CBS spoke over the social media to this, you know, Josh person from Churchbridge, um, and this Josh actually said that he knew Michaela. His quote was, quote, I only saw, talked to her once a week when she was in church bridge at this youth thing, end quote, Josh said. And then his other quote is, quote, then we were out of touch for a few years and then she found my number and we talked a bit more, but then stopped again, end quote. So he pretty much said they stopped talking at least three years before Michaela went missing and after speaking with Josh like this particular Josh law enforcement said there was no indication to believe that Josh Josh was involved with anything uh, that had to do with Michaela's uh, disappearance so like the two kids like we kind of like the two boys we kind of have some information we don't know if this was the exact josh and i do wonder how many joshes did they run into their investigation but we do have like the christopher guy he was apparently not even in canada so he's like not really involved here i don't think and um yeah it seems like the other guy named um Josh I mean yeah to so Josh Josh we don't know who he exactly the Josh was was and Christopher doesn't seem like he was even in Canada so regarding that I think we could jump right into the theories and well honestly dude I think this can only go a few ways this could really go only in three ways in my opinion um so the three ways would be a runaway situation um she ran away from home um human trafficking she was abducted by sinister 
um, individuals and, you know, maybe was trafficked. And then online predator theory where she was maybe um, contacted by an online predator, perhaps catfished. And, uh, you know, bad things escalated from there. So I think we could start off with the runaway theory. Um, unless, wait, I didn't ask, do you have any other, like, ways you see this happening? Because you sometimes have, like, really crazy, like, good points that I kind of miss sometimes. So, for me, it's only three possible ways, but do you see, like, any more? <laughs> no, I think, um, all, I have one, one other, and this is, like, a, a wild card one, but I'll, I'll save it, I think. Let's, let's go through these, these main ones, and I'll, I'll save my, uh, my little fringe one, just as a, as a, as an attack on the end, I think. Awesome. Uh, okay, so um, let's start off with the runaway um, theory. So essentially, uh, the the things that would like we would think that she ran away is because of the police initially they kind of immediately uh, took this case and handled it as a runaway case. Because she did mention leaving for Regina, her movements did entail that she was leaving for a little bit of a longer period of time. She had the backpack on, she was ditching school, um, trying to get out some money. Um, seemed like she was running away, but didn't seem like she was running away for a long period of time. Because she did not clean out her bank account. She didn't take her phone charger. She left Accutane medication at her home. She didn't touch the family cash stash. Um, so it's it indicates that she was planning to run away, but but for a shorter period of time, perhaps returning on the same day, even just in the evening. So to me, what I've got is that she definitely didn't intend to go to school that day, but she didn't intend to run away for like ever she maybe wanted to go to regina have some fun meet up with someone and then get back home on the same day you know what i mean so that's like the initial thoughts that i had regarding the runaway theory i don't think she would run away forever just like that you know yeah i agree it, it is it does i do think it's weird how she made she went out of her way to to tell people and at school like that's that yeah. part out well yeah so i'm going to factor that into i think one of the other theories going on here yeah, yeah. exactly um the other theory is human trafficking so i don't really know what this necessarily entails like i know what it entails but i don't know how it could have happened because we do see her on the phone talking with a lot of guys potentially guys we don't know who she's talking with maybe it's a situation where she thinks she's just meeting up as friends but she's actually getting trafficked as a result if that makes sense now one thing that i've read is that um yorkton was kind of in the in the middle of a lot of like more industrial cities and um, those industrial cities have like higher male populations which kind of increase the human trafficking uh, stats a little bit and Yorkton was kind of in the middle of, of those like areas so it's not completely out of the question that she could have potentially ran into a human trafficking ordeal her mother actually thinks it's likely as well so your thoughts about human trafficking you know it's, it's interesting because someone someone someone's tried to started to leave us a comment about this they were like admonishing us about uh what was the the, the cruise ship episode again amy lean bradley i think yeah man you always remember these things way better than i do the names um yeah so you know, that was, I think, one of the episodes that I did. Uh, that one and, um, oh, the, 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 the high school uh, girl that went missing in um, so Barbados or one of those places. Um, oh, Holloway. Holloway, right? Yeah, that's right, Holloway. So that was another one 
where like you know you dig into these this human trafficking stuff and this person for some reason I, I, it doesn't seem like they they kept their their comment up because I wanted to respond to them because when I've dug into human trafficking and and look I'm 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 really happy if someone wants to leave links in the comments to better educate us about this but I always feel like this ends up being a little bit of like a boogeyman like it it ends up being a little bit of a red herring topic because I mean for sure. Uh, on one hand, I, I guarantee there's tons of human trafficking that goes on from what I can tell. And I mean, just uh, from between the sources and, you know, who you see being trafficked. A lot of the human trafficking seems to be from, let's say, developing nations, right? So um, I always think it's so strange that where I live, gosh, there sure are a lot of massage parlors. I've never been to one. But how is it that there's uh, no joke, like, like in, in my part of the valley, and it's not like, you know, Los Angeles isn't like Las Vegas or something where there's like all these other um, kind of industries built around like tourists. Um, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's industries around tourists, but where I live is not the touristy part of Los Angeles. But I always think it's so strange that there's more massage parlors than there are liquor stores around me. Right mm. and liquor is like what you know what I mean. So so what's really going on there? Well, we we know what it is. I, I've asked like like local business owners and stuff that are adjacent to them. It's 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 human trafficking. It's prostitution, right? But like these are people that are being brought over from developing nations, and then uh, you know, and of course in urban areas, there's also like a lot of people that are taken advantage of from broken homes. So when it's not people from developing nations, it's people from here. It tends to be people who sad to say are not being missed or are coming from drug addiction or, you know, there's, there's other factors, even though I would say the adult industry, that's like kind of another version of human trafficking in a way, because it's often, you know, historically preyed on, you know, people coming from broken homes and, and, you know, uh, runaways, drug addiction. So if, you know, Michaela is a runaway, well then maybe she does fall into that category doesn't this, the, the evidence around that is mixed, but there's always like this kind of idea that there's like, I guess, a quote unquote white slavery that somehow, let's say a young lady like Michaela or Natalie Holloway is like secreted off to some other part of the world, like the Middle East. And there's always, it's kind of like you pick where, where, where the person's going to be sent to and is somehow living like, you know, drugged or chained up in like a harem somewhere or, you know, otherwise being, being a business, a prostitution business. I just, I, I never really see evidence to that effect. And that's where it's like, you know, please, if you, if you do find something like this, where like, you know, they bust some sheik shake in like, you know, Saudi Arabia or something. And he's got 300 women who all claim to have been abducted from, you know, quote unquote, first world countries. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the good that, that, that to tell us so we can know, so we can be corrected. Because I'm not, I'm not saying I, you know, that we we know everything about this topic, but it's, you know, it's almost like like the organ trafficking thing. I almost put them in the same the same bucket, where people think that like there's just people getting snatched off the street, and their kidneys being cut out of them, and I don't. It's always like urban urban legend stuff. I don't. Etc. So okay. That rant aside, yeah, I just I, I I will say that what I would believe though, instead of human trafficking, because I guess the, the theory is someone would let's say catfish her or manipulate her, and then essentially like 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 a pimp, right? Like that's how pimps operate: is that they pretend to be your boyfriend, and then they're pressuring you into doing things with other men for paying clients for them. And before you know it, you're one of several people that this, you know, pimp is essentially forcing into, um, the sex trade. And that, that does happen. Yeah. I just, I don't know how, how much it happens to middle-class young ladies with parents that care. Yeah, I do agree. I do agree that it's, if, if it does happen, it's probably a more rare occasion than from people coming out of different backgrounds and yeah another theory would be an online predator which is kind of 
also very likely, I think, in my opinion, because yeah. she did on the CCTV, but did see her on like having numerous uh, lengthy phone calls, but like made on applications. And it did seem like she was getting kind of jerked around a little bit. So what's your thought regarding online predators? For me personally, I think it's kind of a likely scenario because it did seem that she was talking with someone quite extensively and then she goes missing forever. Like this is, I don't know, this is comp like, this is like a, textbook almost example if if we did in fact if we do end up finding out that that had happened you know because this is a new case it's a fresh case it's still getting worked on so perhaps we will find out and if we do if it's if it does turn out to be like an online predator then i mean this is like a textbook example right yeah and th this is weird because this is actually timely here um something like that happened um Locally, here I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spotlight in details because it happened to a minor. But what happened was there was a, a young lady who um, had like a, a, a physical handicap, like a um, like a, a genetic disease, you know, that one of those ones that affected her muscles. Well, anyway, on one of these social media platforms, uh, Discord actually, she met some 22 year old guy. This guy drove all the way out from Texas and she like absconded with him. She went missing. And this was somebody that had like, once again, uh, as far as I can tell, a like, kind of an ironclad reputation, but suddenly is off and, you know, found in this downtown LA hotel with this guy. And of course <laughs> this guy, he's, his life's over. Right. I mean, there's, uh, this is, I mean, you know, this is like a 15 year old, with the 22 year old who crossed state lines. He's, he's, you know, finished. Um, but it happens and it happens. I think I feel like that probably happens more often than like the somebody being like, like, I guess the reason why I'm saying this is, well, someone could say, well, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you think that this person, if this person could do this, why wouldn't they immediately push her into the, to the sex trade? And I'm not saying that's impossible. Um, it would be interesting to know once again how often like they're breaking up rings like this where you know somebody was recruited you know from like let's say here or canada and not like you know from russia ukraine some place where people have maybe less choices and more financial motivation to believe a story that isn't true or to be kind of like you know have have, have immigration concerns used against them and other things where they're isolated so somebody from from this area, you know, from middle class background, parents that, that care about them, it's it seems more likely. And then I guess the sad part is that I, I could see how somebody could go, let's say the guy doing doing so could go. And then it, it, I mean, it's really sad to say, but it's, unfortunately, you see this a lot where people realize they've made a mistake after they've done whatever they've done with that person. And then they try to cover their tracks because they realize that, you know, much like this guy I just mentioned who did this thing here recently, that they've potentially screwed up their entire lives. Now, whether, you know, especially doing something with a minor, um, all of her actions that day seemed like she was trying to meet up with somebody that she had made plans with and... I can't help but wonder if maybe she did those other things on purpose, like going out of her way to tell her friends that she's going to Regina, talking to a bus station person about going to Regina, but not actually buying a ticket. Okay, uh, just to yeah. stop you right there, uh, I kind of wondered, will you bring this up? And I don't think she, like, I don't think she thought about, like, leaving a red hearing because she knew that in advance uh, she knew that you know the 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 clerk of the bus sta bus station will be questioned and will say oh yeah i've seen her she asked for a bus I, I don't think that was a red hearing for se i don't know why i just stepped in like this but i just kind of thought that maybe you will think that that was a red hearing 
I no, no, you 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 you, you, re- you read my mind, especially after us doing so many episodes together. Yeah, no, you read my mind. I, I was I was thinking like, was she leaving like breadcrumbs for somebody to follow in the wrong direction? Yeah. Um, and even the hotel thing. Oh yeah. Is like really odd. The hotel thing I really don't get because I mean that sounds pretty insidious, right? If you're a parent, that's like the last thing you want to hear if you're her mom. Yeah. I mean that that sounds like bad news, and then I, I mean I guess do you think well do they say what hotel where like was it a hotel there in town or was it going to be like in Regina? Yeah, it was a hotel in town. I think the same hotel that she kind of walked past early on in the day. I think it was yeah a hotel in Yorkton, like in her town that she was living at. So that, I mean, from that perspective, that sounds like she was going to meet up with a guy and they were going to have a, let's say, romantic interlude. So then it went from being, and then if she's getting jerked around on the phone, you know, over social media, the kick, kick, kick chat and call, like they're saying, oh, I can't, like, do you think, is it possible that this person kept on making the excuse that because they were an adult, they couldn't be seen picking her up, right? So maybe they kept on kind of pushing it off, like, well, I'm driving around the area, but there's too many people around. Oh, well, you know, they're going to get us on camera. Oh, well, like, you know, I really can't be seen doing it this way, so can you get on a bus or can you or can you get a room? I just, it feels like somebody getting jerked around a lot. When I look at that, like, it, it feels like there's a lot of, like, like, like the play keeps changing on the you know you know in the, in the in the little game that the person's playing with her like they keep on changing up like well this and and i guess th- this is where i want to add in i guess it's like sort of the public service announcement <laughs> like please if you're getting involved with somebody these are big red flags that they're probably either not worth it because imagine imagine if this wasn't wasn't a catfishing person and it's just somebody you're going to be in a relationship with like how is that relationship going to go? You know what I mean? If this is how they're going to treat you in the first 10 minutes or whatever, you know, the first kind of the opening part of your relationship, it's only going to get worse from there. You know, when they're, when they're, this is like the part of the relationship where they're supposed to be trying to impress you and it's not really impressive behavior. So, um, you know, just, just know it's, it's just like, it's, it's all, (laughs) it's all bad news from there. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I'm really leaning towards that, that, that that online predator catfishing part of things. And I, I don't even know. I mean, it could have been not even the motive could have been something else. Maybe that's why her mom thinks human trafficking because yeah, you would think somebody that was trying to get her, you know, for, for what, what people get together for, you think they would just get to it instead of just jerking her around. So I wonder like, were they trying to, I don't know what you could use a teenager for who doesn't have a credit card or even the ability to sign her own name to something yet, right? Because she's not an adult. You don't really own yourself when you're a, a teenager um, to make financial commitments. I'm trying to think, like, what else could you even use somebody for to try to, like, scam them out of if they don't really have any assets? Now, I do wonder if she told her friends that she had these thousands of dollars, if she had bragged to somebody else um, that she had money that she didn't really have. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Um, I don't know why she said that she had more money than she actually did. It's one of those weird details that I don't think maybe even plays a role in this case. But in respect to what you've said, um, it is weird how she asks for help in renting out a hotel in the same town, I would assume, but then kind of tries and implies to everyone then she's going to regina maybe it's a situation where someone's coming out of town and they already kind of agreed on going to um regina together if that makes sense yeah that could be where like the eventual destination was um yeah so it sounds like you you and i are mostly in agreement um about the online predator theory, you know, that there was something going on. Now, 
do you, is is now the time to kind of whip yeah. out the yeah. The only other thing I was thinking is, is it possible that there was some kind of emergence of, of like a mental issue here? Because you know people did did kind of ele- you know allude to some self harm before. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yes. then oh, yeah. yeah. So one of the theories that I had here as well, like in my head, like potential suicide, and um, yeah. I think that is a scenario, but at the same time, just by looking at the CCTV again, like double checking the CCTV and her calls on the phone, it seemed like she was busy. It seemed it seemed like she wasn't. Uh, she was talking. She was trying to arrange things. She went back to school. She was walking around the place. Sure, that could be like a facade to keep her own head straight but to me it kind of seemed like maybe she she seemed like she wasn't in a mood to potentially kill herself it was a situation where she just wanted to um you know arrange something it didn't it didn't really seem to me just looking at the cctv for so for everyone who's listening to us if you would look at the cctv i think some of you might feel the same way that i do it didn't seem like she was about to kill herself. It really seemed like she was trying to arrange something more than anything like that. But she did have a history of self-harm, which is a bad indication, uh, nevertheless, you know? Yeah, and that, I mean, if I take suicide out of it, because like you said, she just seemed like she was on a mission. You know, I think that was that was also like, once again, just to go back to Andrew Gosden, or Susan Swedell, neither of those people look like they were going to, they, 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 I mean, Susan in this case disappeared with someone else. Andrew had made like a, a very seemingly driven, uh, you know, like, like, like journey somewhere. And, you know, in the case of uh, Michaela, it looked like she, you know, was waiting on somebody and, and had a, a distinct set of things that she had to accomplish that day um, and didn't do anything desperate, like take a whole bunch of money and took out a very specific amount of money, which was was still fairly puzzling because if you were going to kill yourself, well, why not take out all your money? What are you leaving? If you're not, if you're not going to leave behind a suicide note and say, I leave my assets to this person, then why are you not taking all of it with you? Um, yeah, I guess the the only thing I can think of is, what if she is delusional in some way? What if she's not really having? Um, like I guess this, this is not necessarily what I believe, but I'm, I'm putting it out there as a devil's advocate, like a sort of a, an alternate theory. What if she's not really having phone calls? What if she's not really completely right in her head, and that's why she's kind of doing these these weird statements and plans and walking on train tracks and, and, and sort of seems almost just for such an organized person, you know, you said it yourself, she seems somewhat disorganized in terms of like her research and, and her, her path and, you know, entering and leaving the, the, the coffee place, asking people like making kind of strange requests of people that are at odds with other things. She says to people like, Oh, I'm going to Regina, but I need a hotel room now. Here. Or, or pawning, pawning, trying to pawn the silver ring when she has plenty of money. Yeah. Like, why does she need to pawn the silver ring? What is? Yeah, that seemed like such a strange, a strange thing to do, and, and and like random. Like it wasn't at all, unless you know you you buy into my theory that she was trying to offset. You know, she was trying to not have money go missing from the account. That was like inordinate. Like it would be easy to explain away twenty bucks. Like, oh, you know, I needed to get coffee or I needed this or that, and I just, you know, I could, I forgot to ask you for money, mom. But yeah, other than that, yeah. can't. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't it really? It's it's really strange, strange case. Yeah, indeed. So um, just before we wrap up, dude, um, you know, which one of these theories that we kind of discussed would you be leaning the most towards? I just want to, before, you know, I let you answer, I want to quickly put my two cents in. So the runaway thing forever doesn't really play well with me because she left Accutane at home. Maybe Accutane was 
causing her to be unhappy. So even that sense, maybe it would make sense. Um, but it wouldn't, it just the way she talked with her friends, interacted with everyone, didn't seem like she was running away forever, maybe for like a week, but not for life. So I think something, if she did run away, I think something must have happened to her. Human trafficking, as you've said, I would need to see the stats. It's somewhat difficult sometimes to believe, but like I've read on Wikipedia, it says that it's a real thing. It's a real problem in that part of Canada. So um, as you've said, like the backgrounds of the victims are usually different than the Makila's, but you know, I wouldn't necessarily rule that out completely, but I will not say that it's probably the most likely scenario that I'm leaning towards. And I will say the suicide thing or like mental health, I don't know. It seemed like the phone calls were kind of real from the CCTV. They didn't seem like they were faked phone calls because if they were, well, she was attending drama class, so we can't really take, we have to take her acting skills into account. Potentially someone who's taking drama class is maybe someone who's more outgoing and is maybe good at pretending but it didn't seem that way and then lastly i think online predator meeting up with someone and then that someone kidnapping her and potentially um killing her down the line is probably the most likely scenario in my personal opinion just my opinion if i had to bet on any of these i would say an online predator type of a situation where she gets catfished or not necessarily catfished runs into the same person that she thinks she's talking to but then that person turns out to be devious and you know potentially does harm to her down the line so i think she's not alive anymore i think she's dead unfortunately and i think it's probably an online predator that is responsible for this that's just my take on it you know what i mean yeah, I'm right there with you. I'm like 85% online predator that um, made her disappear afterwards. Um, especially when you see how much how much that that has happened. Um, even there's there's, like, like, there's all these cold cases. I keep on seeing it come up where like people were murdered, um, even couples murdered together. Um, you know all these you know. Uh, high school and, and girls and, and, and other children walking home from school that end up disappeared or murdered. They find their bodies years later and they now that they have the DNA, they're able to like track down these people that did it. And I mean, there's a ton of them. There's a, just, I mean, it happens so much more often than you would think. Um, I think it just gets lost in like the, the, you know, all the other things that happen over time. And, you know, the, the major news events sometimes wash out the um the 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 quote unquote smaller stories that are you know still someone's life um and then i'll i'll put the other 15% to the human trafficking now, this is i think where you know i i think i would appreciate the comments and criticism from people that have a stronger case to make about that because i do feel like the more i say it the more i feel a little bad that i'm like so willing to say that someone you know essentially seduced her online and killed her, but not to say that maybe somebody had forced her into, you know, what is, what is, what is kind of like, like a big, yeah. a, a big, you know, criminal enterprise. Right. I mean, for sure, prostitution and forced prostitution and human trafficking is a real thing. So I feel a little bit like a hypocrite for not buying into that theory more. I just, you would think that those places get busted all the time and that somebody like her would turn up like getting basically, unless they somehow got her out of the country. Like that's, that's the part where I wonder like when they say, Hey, that part of the country, that part of Canada has human trafficking. Okay. But like, but like how do they know that? Is that, do they know that because they bust a massage parlor, you know, and then they fingerprint everybody and they're like, hey, you know, you came here from this country. You came here for that country. You used to live in that that ghetto over there and that other city. And, you know, we know, like, you come from a broken family and you're a drug addict, et cetera. So they have names and faces. Like, how often is it that, like, a, a Canadian or U.S. national gets kidnapped and taken across international borders? You know, like, like do we, do, is, there, is there, like, a, is there even one case 
like that from recent years that someone could point us to and say, look, this person, you know, they grew up in the middle class home. And the next thing you know, they're they're like, you know, in, in, in across the border somewhere. Once again, I always ask, why would they do that with all the legal ramifications and the sky falling down on their head than to just get somebody from the Ukraine? You know, we're, we're like, we do know that there's a lot of human trafficking coming out of countries like that yeah. where there's a lot more desperation, right? Exactly. That's a good point. So um, I would say we're kind of in accordance here. I think yeah. an online predator seems like it's every likely scenario here to us. Um, guys, I hope you all enjoyed this episode this week. Um, definitely back to a more you know typical case here definitely a very intriguing missing persons case i really am curious to see what the comment section on our youtube channel is going to be like um this week regarding this case maybe you will have some more interesting details that we may have missed during the show and yeah guys i really hope you all enjoyed um this episode and you know if you enjoyed this episode please subscribe to the channel or like leave a like or you know do whatever you feel like doing but we will catch you on the next week's episode so until then uh stay safe and peace out